chapter 17, and I'll just go ahead and I'll just open this up in prayer tonight. Dear Lord, we just want to ask that you will just help us to receive your word as we study it, and to be able to apply these things to our life. God us in your ways. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. All right, so Acts chapter 17. Uh, so uh, just to kind of get us back in the context, we are talking the we're talking about Paul and Silas. They are they are in the Macedonia area. They have been. Uh, Paul had the vision where the the person from Macedonia was waving to come uh, to to that area, and they get in. They get to uh, this one area and uh, they meet some ladies down by the river and kind of they started a church. Um, we talked about the presence of Luke being. Uh, joining their team and then actually staying uh i guess where where was that place at i think it was thessalonia or something so uh uh so paul is only there for a few weeks and he is and he's kicked out but uh in that in that time he uh he's able to kind of establish a church with uh lydia and her friends and it appears that luke the author of the of the book of Acts is actually one of the stays to be the minister there, as we see a pronoun change. I don't have you have y'all ever heard that before? Just that that Luke joins their team in sixteen. If you look, uh, if you look in chat in chapter sixteen, just look back there for a second. See if I can find the right. get my page to turn here. What are you looking for? I'm looking for the, the pronoun change. I thought I would be able to find it. Verse 10 and 11. Verse 10 and 11. Okay, oh yeah, so it says, and after he had seen the vision immediately, we, okay, we endeavored. Now, if you go back, if you flip over to 17, it says, now when they, so there's a pronoun shift in there, and, it, and it's not there by accident, it means something. Before, before 16, it is a they. When you get to 16, it's a we, and when you get to 17, it's back to a they. Well, the only change that, that we know is Luke. Luke is the change, and we know that he uh, he does become a minister somewhere, and many scholars think that it's here with Lydia and that group because they they get there and there 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 appears to be no men engaged with the gospel or uh, or believing there, so it, they think that Paul left Luke there, and that's what he did oftentimes is that he would have somebody that's that he's been mentoring for a while, and he would set them up and then leave them somewhere that needs a minister to, to, to teach and to train the next group of people and also to do what he's done is to, is to mentor younger, younger believers underneath him. And that really is supposed to be the way it works. Now, uh, you know, well, let, me, let me throw this out there. Uh, the difference between what Paul is working with and, and what we typically work with is that, you know, that people, people younger, younger people just aren't engaged. They're, they're not wanting to receive the word or to become the ministers like, uh, like, like Paul is looking for. He's looking for the Timothys. He's looking for the Titus. Not that there was a bunch back then either, but to have guys with that kind of courage who's like, oh, yeah, I'll follow you along for a while, and I'll learn as much as I can. But really what I want to do is I want you to drop me off somewhere, and I'm going to be the minister in that area and set up a church in, in a place where there is no church. That uh, that. That really is that missionary mindset that uh, we we you know and I and I get that in our American culture we haven't witnessed anything like that because there's churches on every corner, right? But if you go like if you went out west if you went out to Utah where I I spent five years of my life there was not a church on every corner. The churches were were you know fifty. Uh, to a hundred miles apart before you would find uh, a, a true Bible believing church. That's how that's how sparse the distance was. Well, Paul, the 
Paul is just getting started establishing churches. There are no churches anywhere. So that's what he was doing is he, he, he would leave behind somebody and they, they would have some scriptures and then they would, uh, they would grow. As they're growing, they're, t they're teaching others in the way. And that really is a, a we're, we're, you're probably going to see that. You guys will probably witness that in your lifetime as, uh, as, as true churches um, they're, they're, they start becoming fewer and further between even even in the Bible belt. Uh, we're already seeing churches in, on a declining like crazy. The Methodists are voting tonight whether to whether to live by the standard of the scriptures or not. And that's a First Methodist here. In, I think it's First Methodist. Is it First Methodist? It was that's, the First Methodist. That's voting. I think they're voting tonight or today sometime. They may have already voted. But they're voting. Do we go? Do we? Do we? Do we have our church go by the scriptures or not? So uh, that's uh, that's some of the things going on. So that's just kind of the context that we have. Uh, that Paul gets Paul and Silas. They get kicked out of every place that they're going to. They're not allowed to stay very long. Uh, the area is very hostile to uh, to the gospel of Jesus Christ. And and you got it. And we're going to look at some of the thing, some of it tonight. How hostile the area is to the gospel. Well, let's look at verses 1 through 5 in chapter 17. Madison, you want to you want to take on those that first group of verses? Yes, after they passed through and How do you say that? And, and five? Yeah, Amphipolis. Amphipolis and Apollonia, they came to Thessalonica where they there was a Jewish synagogue. As usual, Paul went into the synagogue and on three Sabbath days reasoned with them from the scriptures, explaining and proving that it was necessary for the Messiah to suffer and rise from the dead. This Jesus I am proclaiming to you is the Messiah. Some of them were persuaded and joined Paul and Silas, including a large number of God-fearing Greeks, as well as a number of leading women. But the Jews became jealous, and they brought together some wicked men from the marketplace, formed a mob, and started a riot in the city, attacking Jason's house. They searched for them to bring them out to the public assembly. All right, so uh, here, and, and I guess I told you wrong about Thessalonia. I was, I was getting my, my lessons mixed up. Uh, Thessalonians tonight. He was at Maesia or something, somewhere else before. But here... Uh, we see that Paul has a plan. What, what's the plan as Paul enters in the city? Do you see that plan that he that's really initiated here? What's the plan that you see as Paul enters into a new city? What does he do? Where's the first place that he goes? Synagogue. He goes to the synagogue. Now, why would he go to the synagogue? Because there's a lot of people there, probably. Well, they, they are at least... Um, empathetic to the scriptures, right? They, they at least... Like we like the scriptures now to fully understand Jesus, they they are missing that information. Mm -hmm. So what he does is he would go to the synagogue and he would speak to them using the scriptures that they already have. He would use the scriptures that they already know and say and preach Jesus. He's like, This person that you're looking for has already come and his name is Jesus. And anybody got an idea about what scriptures that he might reference? to be able to do something like that. That the guys in the synagogue, they already know these scriptures. They love these scriptures. Do you, do you have any idea what kind of scriptures that they might, that they might, that he might use? How about Genesis 3.15? Anybody know what that verse is? God tells Eve, you will bear a seed and he will crush the head of the serpent. The serpent will bruise his heel. He will crush the head of the serpent. That's the, that's the first uh, they call him the 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 three fifteen the Genesis three fifteen son. That's going to be born of a woman. That was the first prophetic mention of the coming Messiah. So verses like that. You've been we've been waiting for millennia uh, for this Genesis three fifteen person, and here he is. His name is Jesus. How about Isaiah fifty three? Anybody know what's in Isaiah fifty three? Uh, for unto us a child is born. No, that is Isaiah chapter 9, but that is a good one too. Je Isaiah 53 says, He was wounded for our transgressions. He was bruised for our iniquities. The, the, uh, 
Oh my goodness, it's just slipping my mind. But y'all remember, y'all remember hearing those that uh, he was, you know, the chastisement of our peace is upon him. So that that's Isaiah fifty three, and then we have Psalms twenty two. Anybody know what Psalms twenty two is about? It talks about the 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 worm. Uh, it, it details the, the whole crucifixion a, event on on the Messiah. So it begins. It and this is how uh, Psalms twenty two begins. My God, my God, why hast thou forsaken me? You see, a lot of times people believe. You know, when they when they hear when they when they are reading the New Testament and they start teaching about. Jesus said that he was abandoned by God even on the cross. And really he was answering a question. He was answering the question about, you know, why don't you come down from the cross? You healed others. Why don't you heal yourself? Why don't you save yourself? And he answers their question by saying, my God, my God, why hast thou forsaken me? Well, that the way that the Jews would reference the scriptures is the first line of that portion. They didn't have Psalms 22 back then. They, it would just begin with Psalms, my God, my God, why hast thou forsaken me? It wouldn't have, a, it wouldn't have um, you know, coordinates. It wouldn't have an address. We, uh, you know, our translators put that in there for us. So that's, uh, that's kind of what, what, what his plan was. Now, how was Paul's explanation received once he got into the synagogue? How did they receive him? Anybody? What, what does it look like in there? Yeah, there was a lot of reception, but there was a lot. Of, there was a lot of not receiving. It was mixed, right? Mm -hmm. But there was some, and that's exactly what Paul was looking for. He would, he wasn't looking for everybody. He wasn't looking for everybody to believe the message. He was just looking for some. Anybody ever been fishing before? When you go fishing, you expect to catch every fish in the lake, right? That's why they call it fishing and not catching, right? So people, I like to go catching. When I go, I like to go catching. But even at that, I'm not. Catch, I don't plan on catching every fish out there. Well, that's what Paul is doing. He's like, I'm going. I'm going fishing, and I'm looking for those that ha that God has already been talking to, that are very receptive to the to the gospel. They're looking for answers, and I'm coming with answers. And that's and that's really the way that God wants us to to minister to other people out there too. He wants us when 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 you go out, you're going fishing. Is really what you're doing. You're going fishing with the gospel of Jesus. You're not trying to catch everybody, but you're looking for those that are interested in biting. You know, anybody, anybody bass fishermen? Anybody like to bass fish? Y'all bass fish? You ever use a topwater bait? No? Oh, man, y'all don't know what you're missing. A topwater bait is very much a reaction strike bait. I mean, a... Uh, uh, when I was down in Louisiana, that was the, probably the best place to use it. But I, we've used a buzz bait. Now, a buzz bait makes a lot of noise going across the water. Just, just splash in, and you're like, nothing's going to bite that thing. It's making way too much noise. And then all of a sudden, you see this wave about four inches high heading towards that bait. And when it hits that bait, there is an explosion. It looks like dynamite and goes off in the water. That's a reaction bite. So that's what that's the way he, he's going fishing. He's like, I'm looking for that reaction. Those, they want that. They are looking for, that is what they've been waiting for. That's what they've been looking for. That's the way Paul fishes. He fishes with reaction bites. He's not, he's not throwing out, he's not throwing out the, the you know, the, the, the worm right now. He's throwing out, I want a fast reaction bite. The one who bites this really 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 wants it that's what he's looking for now later on whenever whenever he whenever he's he's teaching that's when he's he's using the more the more sensitive methods really digging into the scriptures kind of like what we're doing tonight so we get there and the reactions mix he does get a little bit of a following but there's some people who really do not like what he's got going on let's look at verses five through nine kaylin you want to take those So the Jews became jealous, and they brought together some wicked men from the marketplace, formed a mob, and started to riot the city. Attacking Jason's house, they searched for them to bring them out to the public assembly. When they did not find them, they dragged Jason and some of the brothers before the city officials, shouting, 
These men who have turned the world upside down have come here too. And Jason has welcomed them. They are all acting contrary to Caesar's decree, saying that there is another king, Jesus. How far? Just to nine. And the crowd of the officials who heard these things were upset. After taking a security bond from Jason and the others, they released them. All right. So here we have uh, the introduction to Jason. Who's Jason? Someone who tells them. Yeah, he is. He is just somebody. He was at the. He was at the synagogue. He he invites Paul and Silas and whoever else is with him. Like, come to my house. Share with me more of this Jesus. I want to know more. So he gets there, and but there's but there's some things going on, right? There are some Jews that believe not, and they moved with envy. This is in verse 5. And it says, took unto them certain lewd fellows of baser sort. Now, I want, us, I want us to think about what we have going on here. When the devil starts to move in a community, most of the time, these people that are lewd, what do, what do you think about when you hear that word lewd? What do you think about? If you saw a lewd person, how would you describe that person? I don't know what lewd means. Do what? Yeah, they have a lot of scandals, right? They're, they are they are the go-to people of the society, right? No, they're the people you don't trust. These are the people. They're 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 the scoundrels in the society. There there's a lot of perversion that goes along with it. They use a lot of foul language. Their life is is reprobate. I mean, they just, they're not your upstanding citizens in the community. No, and then it says, and then they use the baser guys. I mean, these are the guys, you, you do not want these people helping you out, right? But I'm going to be, I'm going to be honest. I have seen this with my own eyes that when the gospel and the, go, and, and the principles of, the, of, God, of godliness comes in on the scene, the ones that the city officials will listen to are not the are not the cleaner guys. They're not the taxpayers. They're the lewd, and they are the base people of the community. They will listen to those guys. I mean, these guys, they they've been arrested five or six times. They you know they they they're living they're living in a rundown rundown house or an apartment complex. It's like they're not. They're not your upstanding citizens here. They are their problems. But when the gospel comes in on the scene and godly principles are being applied, those people, they stir those people up and the city officials will listen to those rather than guys like Jason. Man, I, you know, I'm just trying to, I'm trying to do good for my family. I, I'm hearing about Jesus. Well, Jesus matches the scriptures. I, you know, I just want these standards in my life. No, you. These guys are turning our world upside down. You see, the, one of the issues that we need to understand as as God fears, as believers in Jesus Christ, is that the world and this government that we have actually is under the authority of the devil. Does that make sense to you? He is the God of this world. He is running the governments, and he loves power. He loves power. And with, but when the gospel really comes into play, the devil loses power and he loses control over people. You know, one of the things that, and, and I challenge you, take a look at what's really going on. That when officials begin to lose power, that is when you will see the lewd people and the baser people come out. You remember the protest that was going on up in Portland? Were, those were upstanding citizens that were that were out in the streets burning down the town, right? No, they were thugs and criminals. Yet, what did the how did the politicians respond to them? They let them do whatever they wanted to do, right? They wouldn't stand up against them. We even have the Rittenhouse kid. I mean, somebody who was standing, who who a, a kid who was standing guard over, you know, over a, a family friend's business. And he he shoots some people to protect, but because he was attacked, 
And how did how did the how did the authorities respond to that? They went after him with the authority of the state. You see, when godly when when politicians begin to lose control, when the devil starts to lose control, that's what he does. He sends out the lewd and the base. Y'all keep your eyes out for that, okay? Because y'all are about to witness that again. Because there is there is a there is a power hungry uh, group out there, and they and there is control. Satan is. We're getting. You know the scripture tells us this. This is for free. It's not part of the story. But we see in the scriptures as we get towards the last days, but right before Jesus comes back, that the devil realizes he's losing control. So he begins to initiate his final plan to regain control of the earth, kind of like what it was back during the uh, Babylon. You remember? Does everybody know the story of Babylon? You know where they all spoke one language, but God, but they would disobey God. But they were building this tower up to heaven. Y'all remember that story? And God came down and he he gave them all the different tongues that we now have, and he confused the people so that they were no longer able to do their work because now they couldn't understand each other because they all spoke a different language. Everybody remember that story in Genesis? For the most part, man, you guys got to read your Bible. We're talking about Jesus about to come back, and if you don't know if you don't know the beginning of the story. Then you know you're not going to recognize when the end comes. So, so you need to understand. Well, what did it look like back then? Well, it was the devil was controlling the mind of the people. He had them all underneath one language and one kind of government, so to speak. And that's what he's doing. He's trying to take what we have now, that's many governments, and bring it back to one government. That's what we see initiated in the in the Book of Revelation, where a one world government kind of comes into play. And there's a power grab that happens because the devil's losing control and he doesn't like it. He wants it back. And he's like, this is my opportunity. I am taking it back. So what you, what you will see is you will see violent protest all over the world, many of them. You will see countries collapse. You will see governments just fall apart. You will see, a com you will see people hurting left and right you will see homelessness rise like you've never witnessed it before you will see you're going to you're going to see horrible things and that is satan's power grab and he initiates it by you and this is just a small picture of how he does it when the gospel when the gospel starts coming in he's like you can't stand it and one of the things we're not seeing it in our in our country as much but all over the Eastern world, we're seeing uh, an awakening and a, a revival of people coming to know Jesus Christ as their Lord and Savior. Just because you're not witnessing it here doesn't mean it's not going on. But it is going on. And Satan realizes, I'm losing control. And he wants it back. And so that, that's, I'm just telling you, when you see that happening, know that that's really what, what was prophesied at the end, and that's what's going on. Is Satan is reach? He he's doing he's doing a power grab, and he's stirring these people up, and they attack Jason in his house. And this is what and this is their argument. They turn the world upside down. I mean, this is this is how they turn the world upside down. Okay, so now you don't go you. You know, you stay away from the cultic worship centers. You know what's going on at the cult, cultic worship centers? Well, there's prostitution, where men and women are giving themselves freely for, what, for whatever to, to appease the gratification of, of their visitors. And they have all kinds. It doesn't matter. Men with men, women with women, men with women. It, it doesn't matter. Everything goes there. And that's, that's what's going on at the cultic center. And they're like, so now we have some people that are teaching against that. You're turning our world upside down. Oh, oh. So, so we want, we, what we're telling you is that, that men and women should be faithful, that they should raise their kids godly to do, to do good, and that's turning the world upside down. Well, yeah, it is turning the world upside down because the world is chasing after their own sensual na na uh, nature and when following and, and appeasing and appeasing what the devil wants. He just wants he wants people to be out of control. He and he wants them to be controlled only by the government.
And usually when governments do that, that they, they bring in pain and suffering when they do that. But anyway, uh, they, they have to deal with the nonsense that's going on there. Um, and they end up having to, you know, to leave quickly because of all the nonsense, because their lives are at stake. Uh, let's look at verses 10 through 14. Isaac, you want to take those? Verses 10 through 14. Read loud. And a brother immediately sent away Paul and Silas by night to Berea. Coming thither, went into the synagogue of the Jews. These were more noble than those in Thessalonica, in that they received the word with all readiness of mind and searched the scriptures daily, whether those things were so. Therefore, many of them were also of honorable women and of the priests and of men in our day. But then the Jews of Thessalonica had knowledge of the word of God that was preached to Paul at Berea. They came thither also and stirred up. And then immediately the brethren sent away Paul to go as it were to the city. But Silas and Timotheus abode there still. All right, so what just happened here? They, they have the issue of Thessalonica, and, and they, they were immediately sent away by night. They had, they had to leave at night so that they, uh, because it was, just get, it was getting bad. There was people waiting out for them, and they came to Berea. Now, what does it say about Berea in verse 11? Um, they were of more noble character than those in Thessalonica. Yeah, what, is, what does that mean? Right, they, they were, you could at least reason with these guys, right? At Thessalonica... They weren't out to get them. <laughs> right, they're, they're like, they're not turning the world completely upside, upside down. They're like, you know, you, some of the things that you're saying are making some valid points, you know. That, and God is reasonable. You know, in Isaiah 118, he says, come and let us reason together. So God wants to reason with you, and he's got some good points. That, that And really, and I don't know, maybe you... I don't know if you guys think like I do uh, as much, but really the only way that this world makes sense is when I view it through the, the lens of the scripture. Like it doesn't make sense to me why our government acts the way it does. It doesn't make sense to me why people accept the lifestyles that they accept. Except when I look at the scriptures, it tells me what's going on in their minds because my mind and their minds do not match the things that they do. Do not make any sense to me. You know why? You know why? You know why would you make certain purchases with your with your money? You know why would you buy things that you don't need in the place of things that you do need? Like that that doesn't make any sense to me. But but it does when I look at the scriptures. The scriptures help me make sense of the things that are just crazy in this world so looking through the lens of the scripture will will help you understand i think what's going on and here the bereans that's what they, that's exactly what they're doing they're they're listening to paul and they're like well let's check this stuff out let's see if these things are actually true and so what they're willing to do is they're like well let's let, let's look at the scriptures you're you're referencing the scriptures we believe the scriptures let's look at those things and that's that's what that's what they're talking about they were, they were different. They were more noble in their character. They were more reasonable. They're not, they weren't as crazy, prone to a riot. Um, and then look, look who, what it says in verse 12. Who became the believers there? Greek. Yeah, and, and it says that they were honorable people, right? So we've got some people that they're, they're looking into this world, and they're like, this world does not make sense. But whenever we start reading about Jesus and we start reading how it relates to the scriptures, like all of a sudden, man, this stuff is making sense. You know, one of the things that, about believing is that it doesn't have to be irrational belief. You don't have to have blind faith. You can have reasonable faith. Things that make sense. You can look at the evidence and say, well, how does this evidence line up with the scriptures? And one of the things that you that you would be able to do is, I mean, even if you take science, I love science, and I can take science, and I can take archaeology, and I can take history, and you know what I found out? That 
the, 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 the better the science gets, the more accurate the history gets, the more archaeology is, is found, the more it, it promotes the scripture. The more it, it, just, it just confirms that the scripture is of honest integrity and tells us the truth. And it validates it. Left and right. Every single bit of it. I mean, we're, you know, scientists have just started figuring out that, uh, you know, that, the, that how, how big the universe is. But it expands and it contracts. Well, the scripture says 18 different times that the, that the universe stretches itself out. Well, that's something that they just recently learned. And since, probably since you got, since some of you guys have actually been born. One of the things that was that was interesting back in, uh, uh, I don't know, uh, I can't remember when. It was like in the early 15, 1600s or so, that uh, a guy was, a guy, I forget his name. Hey Ben, I need you to, I need you to sit still, okay, buddy. That he he's laying on his deathbed and somebody's reading a scripture to him and he reads this passage in Psalms that says that there's currents in the ocean, and he's like, well, if the Bible says that. There must be currents out there. So he started finding the currents in the ocean, and all of a sudden the shipping industry changed because now they can start, they know where the currents are, and they can follow the currents in the ocean to make their shipping adventures quicker. So this, how long did it take? Well, that science didn't know that, but the Bible did. And finally, science got caught up to the scriptures, and that happens over and over all the time. So here we have the Bereans are looking for this information. They're finding it. And um, they uh, and they accept the things that Paul is is saying a lot a lot easier. Now look at um, let me see I lost lost my place a little bit. Whenever whenever we. Looking back at at verse 13, look at verse 13. It says, But when the Jews of Thessalonica had knowledge that the word of God was preached of Paul at Berea, they came thither also and stirred up the people. What does that tell you about the people of Thessalonica? They weren't receiving of the word. Yeah, they, didn't, they didn't want anybody receiving it, right? They're following Paul around. They will not let him go. They weren't even from Berea, but they show up to Berea to cause problems. Well, honestly... I've actually seen that here in Jonesboro where people from other places are shipped in to Jonesboro to cause problems when, uh, when, when people are standing up against some, some evil things. And it, it's amazing that I'm like, oh, that's not even, that's not even new. That's an, old, that's an old tactic that, that we see there. So here we have that they will not let it go. Um, now, I... I think it's a, it's an it's important. Has anyone ever read the book of Thessalonians? You ever read the book of Thessalonians? Uh, I have. Yeah, how many books are there? Two. There's two. Yeah, there's two books of Thessalonians. So when you read the book of Thessalonians, it's important to understand the mindset there whenever you read those those books. It will give you a little bit more insight as to well what am I what is Paul actually talking to? Who is he talking to? He's talking to some people that are having some they have some big issues in that city. They hate the gospel, and they hate those who would present it. So Paul's not even able to stay very long until the Thessalonians come to Berea and stir up a lot of trouble again. So then he go, they send him out again. Let's look at verses 15 through 21. Would anybody like to take that? That's a, that's a little bit longer passage. Anybody want to take it? Micah does? Okay. And they that connected Paul brought him to Athens, and receiving a commandment unto the Silas and Timotheus, for to come to him with all speed, and they departed. And while Paul waited for them at Athens, his spirit was stirred in him, and he saw the city wholly given to idolatry. Therefore disputed he in the synagogue, the synagogue with the Jews, with the devout persons, and the market daily with them that met with him, and certain philosophers and of the Afro 
Yeah, just go on. Yeah, and the Stoics encountered him, and some said, what does this blabber say? For some he had seen to set forth a strange god, because he preached unto the, because they preached, because he preached unto them Jesus in the resurrection. And they took him and brought him to Aeropius, saying, may we know what this new doctrine thereof thou speakest is. For there thou bringest a certain a strange thing into our ears, we would know therefore what these things mean. For all the Athenians and strangers which were there spent their time in nothing else but either to tell or to hear something or some new thing. Alright, so here we have Paul gets to Athens and he's looking around. Now Athens, uh, yep, Y'all, have y'all all read like mythology and stuff? Y'all know the mythologies and things, the Greek gods. Athens is a big name city in uh, in in that world, and they have all kinds of gods and stuff that they worship there. And they have the they have philosophers there, um, guys like anybody know some of the philosophers that that were from Athens? Socrates. Who else? Plato. So there. So y'all know. Maybe y'all know a couple of those guys. So if you are, if you, if you go into like the world of philosophy or psychology, you, you'll read, you'll read about some of these guys and how they, how they kind of make their way through the logical sequence of things and try to make sense of the world. So, uh, so really, we have, we have Paul come on the scene. And I wish I had a, I didn't think about it, but if I could have given you a chart that showed you how these guys come along, that Paul really isn't that far removed from guys like Plato and Socrates, the, the Greek thinkers. I mean, he's only maybe a couple hundred years behind some of them, maybe. Um, I, really can't, I really can't remember um, precisely. But, you know, I, I, think it, I think that he knew about about some of these guys I think he knows what they said he would even he would even uh, he would even say things like you know uh, he would even use some of their quotes from uh, you know later on in the scriptures he, he would one of them uh, the quote was he's like those guys are lazy guys he's like I'm not calling you lazy one of your own one of your own philosophers calls you lazy scumbags <laughs> so that's really as we kind of the, the modern interpretation of that's what this guy refers to them because they don't they didn't want to work they just wanted to they just want to sit around and just think all the time they're just thinkers uh, whatever so Paul is talking to them about it and he presents to them the gospel well to them they're like man people show up with strange ideas all the time around here let us know a little bit more about it so he they bring him up to this one area and they just kind of sit patiently and they let Paul do his thing and he begins to speak to them about Jesus, and then he begins to talk to them about the resurrection. And the resurrection, man, it just, it just shuts them down. I'm going to read these next 10 verses. If you'll follow along with me in verse 22, it says, Then Paul stood in the midst of Mars Hill and said, Ye men of Athens, I perceive that in all things ye are too superstitious. Okay, now I want you guys to pay attention. Key phrases. I want you to. I want your ears to be attuned. Look for. Hear some key phrases, as we go through this. For as I passed by and behold your devotions, I found an altar with this inscription to the unknown God, whom therefore you ignorantly worship him. Declare out unto you, God that made the world and all the things therein, seeing that he is Lord of heaven and earth. Dwelleth not in temples made with hands, neither is he worshipped with man's hands, as though he needed anything, seeing he giveth to all life and breath and all things, and hath made of one blood all nations of men, for to dwell on all the face of the earth, and hath determined the times before appointed and the bounds of their habitation, that they, sh that they should seek the Lord, if they haply they might feel after him and find him, Though he be not far from every one of us, for in him we live and move and have our being, as certain also of your own poets have said, for we are also his offspring. 
more as much then as we are the offspring of God, we ought not to think that the Godhead is like unto gold or silver or stone or graven by art and man's device. And at times of this ignorance God winked at, but now commandeth all men everywhere to repent, because he hath appointed a day in the which he will judge the world in righteousness by that man whom he hath ordained, whereof he hath given assurance unto all men, and that he hath raised him from the dead. Now listen to this. And when they had heard of the resurrection of the dead, some mocked, and others said, We will hear thee again of this matter. So Paul departed from among them, howbeit certain men clave unto him, and believed, among the which was uh, Denisius, an Arapagite, and the Arapagite, and a woman named uh, Damaris, and others with them. So, what were some key phrases that you saw in that? Did you hear them uh, as, as I read through them? Superstitious. They were superstitious. What would make them superstitious? Well, yeah, they had a God for everything, right? Well, mine says that they were, it didn't say they were superstitious. Mine says they were extremely religious. Extremely religious. There's a fine line between superstitious and, uh, and extremely religious, right? What else do you see in there? Um, Look at verse 24. You see one in there. Kind of a key a key phrase how about the lord of heaven and earth dwelleth not in temples made with hands what does that mean it's not an idol or it's not a fake god that they're worshiping he doesn't dwell in one place yeah. do what he doesn't dwell in one place he doesn't place. dwell in one place what does the scripture tell us because jesus jesus kind of talked about this with the woman at the well a little bit right what did he tell her she, she makes the same comment, right? She says, the Jews say that we got to worship in Jerusalem, but our, 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 our people here say that we need to worship here. And this is where we worship. It's like, well, who's right? And what does Jesus say? Neither one of y'all. Neither one. <laughs> he says, there's a day's coming in which you're not going to be able to worship God in, in a facility, but you worship God in spirit and in truth. That's what Paul is talking about. He says you're supposed to worship him in spirit and in truth. Well, what does that mean? What does that mean to worship him in spirit and in truth? That it's not in one centralized location. You just worship him with your self and your spirit in general and how you act and how you carry yourself. Well, if you let, – let's look at this like that. If you Let's say you have a really good friend. Anybody have a really good friend? What makes that person a really good friend? Hmm? You don't know what makes them a really good friend? Well, what if it, you invited them to your house and, uh, and, that, that, and me, you know, as soon as you turn your back, they're, they're looking through your drawers and, uh, and uh, they're, they're, they're wandering around the house and, and uh, they're, going, they're looking for the jewelry box. Uh, what were, is that person a really good friend? Nope. Because <laughs> what are they doing? What are they doing? Yeah, they're looking to stake something from you. You can't trust them. Look, if you're gonna if you're gonna have a really good friend, that means that there's there's trust, there's a relationship. You know, if there's if, if you know they have they don't like something that you did, well, they're gonna tell you. I don't, you know, I really don't like you doing that. You know, that just that just really bothers me. You want to push my button? That's it. You know, sometimes sometimes friends will push each other's buttons on purpose, but they're doing it. To just mess with them, they know that that's what they're doing. And if the person, if they have a good relationship, when the person says, "Dude, will you stop?" He's like, "All right, all right, I'll, I'll stop. I'll quit messing with you." So that's that's really what we're talking about in spirit and in truth. You know the person. You've got a relationship with the person. You're not trying to take anything from them. You might mess with them a little bit, but you're not. You're not want. You're really not wanting to hurt them in, in any other way. In fact, if, if something happened to that person and they needed you immediately, man, you would drop whatever's going on in your life and you would be there for them, right? That's what we're talking about. When he says, "The Lord of Heaven 
it is not worshipped in places made with men's hands. It's because there's a relationship there. So if, so if you've got that type of relationship with a, a person, how much more should you have that with your creator? Who actually knows more about you than, than uh, your best friend or even your parents or even yourself. You don't even know yourself as good as what God knows you. He knows everything about you. He knows all your buttons. He knows all of your, he knows what makes you tick. He knows what will make you happy. He knows what will make you sad. Sometimes you may even get confused. You're like, I don't know why I feel the way that I feel. Well, God knows exactly why you feel the way that you feel. And probably if you ask him why you feel that way, he would tell you. But a lot of times you, you don't want to know. You just, you're just like, I just like, the, I just want to, I just like feeling angry. <laughs> Some people are like that. So that's, that's what he's talking about in that verse. Let's look at a different one. Uh, look at... Look at verse 27. What do you see there? How about that part that says, Though he be not far from every one of us. What does that mean? Hmm? He's not just the big guy in the sky. Yeah, he's not the man upstairs. He's not a far off God. He's a guy who's really close to you. He's like this close. Just because you can't see him doesn't mean he's not there. He's not very, he, Paul says he's not far from us. He got to witness that with Stephen. You know, when Stephen was being stoned by the very person who's <coughs> preaching this message, which this is a very similar message to what Stephen preached, is that Stephen looked up and he says, I see Jesus standing at the Father's right hand. How far away was Jesus? Well, he was this close. He was this close. Close enough to reach where you could reach out and grab his hand and he could and he could pull you in. That's how close he was. Look at uh, look at 26. I missed one there. Look at 26. And he hath made of one blood all nations of men. I think that's a very intriguing verse. What does that mean? What does that mean? He's made of all nations, one blood. Nobody wants to talk about that? That means it doesn't matter if you're black or white, Italian, Chinese, African, South American. You all bleed red. All of your blood can be tracked all the way back, at least to Noah. Even further back to Adam. You all, we all came from one blood. So what does that mean? Is that, God's not prejudiced. That just means he likes variety. Okay? I mean, I mean, you look around this room, you all look a little bit different, and that's okay. If you all looked the exact same, it, it would bother me. You ever been around identical twins? Man, I hate that. It's trippy. Uh, we, like, we like variety. Why, why would you like variety in your life? I, I see everybody's got, like, different colored clothes on. Why aren't you all wearing, like, black or white? Hmm? Because you don't want, you 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 like variety. Nobody has the exact same color clothes on. Well, why is that? Because God, when He made you, He put inside of you His image. Well, part of that image is you like variety. God likes a variety. You know, He He likes cats that have, that look different. He likes cows that look different. He likes people that look different. That's why there's no difference between black or white or red or yellow or whatever. I want to wrap this up by looking at this, fi at this final thought. When Paul gets to the very end, they stop him at what? When, when did they stop Paul from talking? Ben, when, when did they stop Paul from talking? Anybody want to help him out? The resurrection. The resurrection. And I started thinking about this. If somebody was going to ask you about the resurrection of the dead, what would you say? Zombies. <laughs> you know what? I said zombies. Zombies, zombies yeah. <laughs> zombies. And that's what they're thinking. They're like, you're talking about zombies? That people? The undead? What? Why? 
So Paul is not talking about that. He said he says when Jesus came back, he was not a zombie. He came back more powerful than what he went in. What went into the ground came up better than what came out of the ground. Why does the why is the resurrection so important in the Christian world, in the believing world? Why is it that whenever people hear about the resurrection that all of a sudden they shut down? They're like, nope. I can I, I don't mind you talking about a Jesus who, who was able to do miracles. I don't mind even hearing some preaching. But if you're talking about a resurrection, no, no, shut her down. We got to stop. Why? Is it because death then is supposed to be like the end of the line? I think so. I think a little bit. I want you to think about the resurrection just for a second. Uh, as I was thinking about it, and I'll just read kind of what I put together that kind of defines the resurrection. The resurrection is the return of a departed soul. That's what death is, right? The soul leaves the body. It leaves the vessel that it was in. So, but the resurrection is the opposite. It is the return of, the, of a departed soul back into its body. Now, the problem with, with the resurrection at the end is that there's a, when Jesus comes back, he, there's a resurrection that happens. You're com people will be coming back to a body that is gone. Well, it's actually not completely gone. It's just in, it's in a different subject. It's in a different form, right? It turns back to the dust. That's what, that's what we see from Genesis chapter 3 and 19. Till, uh, till thou return unto the ground, for out of it wast thou taken, for dust thou art, and unto dust shalt thou return. That is the, the death penalty that was put on Adam and Eve and was passed from Adam to each generation afterward. That every body dies. But the soul lives on. You ever you ever wonder that? I just thought about it as I was saying that it says every body dies, but not the soul. Your soul is eternal. It's going somewhere. Y'all realize that? That every body every body is gonna is gonna die, but every soul is gonna is gonna be walking one day. The body will die, but the soul will continue on. And it will, it will continue on into either everlasting life or everlasting death. The resurrection gives you back your body. Does that make sense? That's, that's what Paul is talking about. But these guys, they're like, Ben, don't touch that, okay, buddy? So, but, they, but, they, but they're like, nope, shut her down, shut her down. We can't, we can't have souls returning to a body. It messes up nature. It, may, it messes up the things that we know. So the departing of the soul and the body, uh, the soul from the body, and then the body returning to the ground, that is the, that is the grand finale of the sin experience that happened in the garden. So the grand finale of sin in your life is the death of your body. Okay? Does that make sense? In this world, your body, the grand finale is nothing. <laughs> it quits on you. So the resurrection is the opposite of that. So this is an event that no one has control over. You cannot control anything about the resurrection. Does that make sense to you? You can't control when your, body, when your soul leaves your body. You can't control when your soul returns back to the body. That is totally in the hands of Jesus Christ. No person can separate their soul and then have it return as they please. When the soul departs, it returns unto God who gave it. That's Ecclesiastes 12 and verse 7. Do you realize that? The scripture says that. That your soul will return to the one whom gave it. God gave you your soul. Your parents gave you a body. So once that body quits, the soul will return to God. And what is it? You know what happens when it returns to God? It's judged. It's judged according to what it has done with the Lord and Savior Jesus Christ. What has your soul done with Jesus? Has it lived for him? Has it believed him? Now, the only one who was able to, to go against this, this natural process was Jesus Christ, who happened to be God in the flesh. He had complete control over his soul and his body. So when he was on the cross, he said... Into thy hands I commend my spirit. 
So he gave up the ghost. He was able to, <coughs> to release his soul at his, at his own, at his own um, demand. But then on the third day, he said, I will rise again. And I have this promise from the Father that if I give my life freely, I can freely take it again. So after the third day, his spirit came, came back to the, bo to the body. And the scripture says that his body would receive no corruption. It wasn't going to return to dust. So Jesus stopped the natural process. So that was the resurrection of Jesus Christ. Now, he offers the resurrection to, uh, to those who believe and that he will give you a new body one day, even after this one is broken because this is a broken body. The difference between Jesus' body is that it was never broken. It was not, and it gets kind of complicated. I don't have time to go into all the details. But his body was, sin was passed from Adam to the next generation. But Jesus' body was never, never went through that same process. He, his body came through the seed of a woman. A virgin shall conceive and bear a son. That's not typically how it works, right? So the resurrection is the opposite of what we naturally experience in death. The soul returns to its body, which is contrary to what we have accepted as natural life events. The resurrection event is the nullification of the sin experience and the unification of the original intention of life everlasting without a simple mindset. So really, the, the original intention from God was that you would have your body and you would have your soul together forever. But sin caused that to stop, where your body will eventually die and your soul will return to God to judgment. And that is where it will either go into everlasting life or everlasting death, but it is an everlasting thing. It will be somewhere forever. And that should scare you to death if you don't know Jesus Christ as your Lord and Savior. Because that when your soul goes to everlasting death, that is eternal separation from God. The scripture tells us that where it goes was not meant for that soul. It was meant for the devil and his angels. But it is where the rebellious go. If they follow their father, the devil, then they will go to the same place that the devil is going to go. It is a place of darkness. It is the bottomless pit. The, tongue, the, the fire is not quenched. You ever been burned? You ever, have a, ever had a, a tongue so dry that it couldn't be quenched? That's what it will feel like for the rest of eternity. You think, well, man, I, I, I had a, a couple of days like that. We're talking about forever and ever and ever and ever. It never will go away. The worm doesn't die. The, you, you know how maggots eat the body? You will feel that for eternity. It should, it should bother you to think, oh, that's something that could happen to me if I do not know Jesus Christ as my Lord and Savior. But the soul who goes into everlasting life, God says, I don't want you to go through eternity without a body. I'm going to give you one back. Now, I want you to think about this just for a second. The deprived mind, the mind that is against God, will struggle with this. It's always going to struggle with this, mainly because they live in a mindset of death. They want death to be the end. They don't want to think that there's something after the death of this body. But there is something after the death of this body. And that's why the resurrection bothers this world so much. They don't want there to be anything left. They want this world to be the best that is ever that that there is. And you know, if you don't know Jesus as your Lord and Savior, what you're experiencing in this world is the best that you will ever receive in your whole existence, which is eternal. That is why, but for the believer, this is nothing compared to the glory that you're going to experience when you see Jesus and he gives you your resurrection body. The simple ways earn the wages of death. That is all they know. That is all they will experience. The life that they now have is the best that they will ever know as they continue to heap God's wrath upon their person and their soul. They love their sin, even though they hate the consequences. And that's the way people are. They don't, they don't want to have consequences for the sin. The problem is there is consequences for sin. There's always consequences for sin. There's a consequence for everything. If you live for God, there's a consequence for living for God. You know what that consequence is? God's glory. The consequence for living for the devil? 
is the same payment that the devil receives. Hell, eternal separation, darkness, all those things that I mentioned earlier. However, lives that have have had their spirits quickened, that means that they're made alive, they're made, they're, re they're renewed, they do, they do not know, nor can they understand until they believe in Jesus Christ. So lives that have not experienced God's Holy Spirit, they will not understand hardly anything that I've said to you tonight. It will, it's, it, they're going to be confused in their mind. They're not going to get it. They're not going to understand. But those of you who do, you're probably like, I, you're, you're saying some things that kind of make some sense to me. It, you know what answers? Maybe I'm hoping that I'm able to answer a few questions for you. Because the, the only way that you're really going to understand what I'm telling you tonight is if, you know, God's already been talking to you and he's growing inside of you. But if he's not, then you're probably bored out of your mind with this lesson tonight. And that should bother you. That should bother you. That you need to understand, you need to believe in Jesus and his work. And the Holy Spirit will make you alive, and you will live an everlasting life. <coughs> that's just that's just a little bit of what's behind the resurrection. But hopefully, it ex helps answer a question like, "Well, why do people get upset? Why do these guys shut Paul down when they, he started talking about the resurrection?" They can't handle knowing that there is accountability after this life. Accountability bothers them. You ever talk to a criminal? You go visit them in jail, and you ask them, you know, like, you know, what's, you know, uh, if you could have got, if you could have got away with what you did, would they, would they have been excited about that? Yeah, they, they didn't want the consequences of going to jail. They didn't want accountability. But you cannot run from God. He writes everything down. <laughs> you will be held accountable. We all will be. But the good thing is, if you believe in Jesus Christ. You, you, you get, he will grant you forgiveness of your sins. He will blot out your sins. They will not be remembered. They'll be cast as far as the east is from the west. They'll be cast like, just like they're cast in the deepest part of the ocean. They will never be found. That's what God does to your sin. He says, I even I am he that blotteth out thy transgression for my own sake. It will not remember thy sin. He doesn't want to remember your sin. He wants to block them out. He wants you to have everlasting life. He's not willing that any should perish, but that all should come to the knowledge of his resurrection. And a lot of times that's when I pray, Lord, that I may know you in the power of your resurrection. That's what the Apostle Paul prays. That's what I pray. I want to know more about that power. Final thoughts. Anybody got any questions? Let me pray for you guys. Dear Lord, that you would be with all of these that are here tonight, that you would touch their hearts, their minds. Grow them, Lord, in your grace and increase their faith. In Jesus' name I pray. Amen.